Good morning. Everyone, please stand for our first song.
Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us that we might gather together and worship your holy name, for your name is holy, 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 three times holy, and we are not. But it's because of your holiness and righteousness of what you've done and sending your one and only Son that whoever believes on his name will not perish but have everlasting life. You took upon yourself our righteousness and gave us your holiness that we might be righteous in your sight. Father, we just praise and, and glorify your name for that. We pray that our hearts and minds are open to hear you, to hear your word this morning, that how it might apply to each one of our lives and just continue to speak to each one of us, guide and direct us. Continue to show us your calling on each one of us. Father, we praise you and praise your name for it's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good to see everybody this morning. Just a couple quick announcements. We'll get right back to our worship. All right, ready or, ready or not, here we come. This Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we'll begin our study through Exodus. So we finished up Genesis last time around. So this Wednesday at 7, we'll, we'll continue, um, continue to keep on going, and we'll start up in Exodus. So it's a continuation from Genesis. So if you want to read chapter 1, that's what we'll be covering this Wednesday at 7 o'clock leadership conference that's coming up here in a couple of weeks on the 26th at First Southern in Coffeeville. Again, it's a free conference, provided a free lunch. If you are going to go, there's the information on the bulletin board uh, to pl please send that email. That way they make sure they have, have you registered. That way they can have um, all the meals provided for you. That's all we got this morning. Look at it. Quick and easy. <laughs>
may stand for our offertory. <laughs> Luke chapter 12, as we close out the chapter in verses 54 through 59, so everything that's been said these past few weeks, it all ties together, it culminating here with the exhortation to be ready for the Lord's return. A couple of weeks ago, we saw that Jesus gave three parables of servants, those who are, who are either ready for his return or those who were not. And those who were ready received great reward 
while those who were not ready received severe punishment. And in both of those cases, they are eternal, the reward and the punishment. Once that door is shut, it will not be reopened. And those on the wrong side of the door will only hear, depart from me, I do not know you. Last week, we saw that Jesus said his desire is that judgment is already taken place, that he came to bring fire, and his wish is that the earth was already burning. God is ready to be done with sin. He desires to bring final cleansing. And he said this 2,000 years ago. How much more do we believe that's true today with everything that's going on? But first, before the judgment, there was the cross. I have a baptism to be baptized with, Jesus said. And that baptism of his death. Similarly, our baptism is a picture of this same death. We die to self and we're put under the water as though we are put into the grave, buried, leaving our sin there in death. And then we are raised from the water as though we are raised from the dead from death to life, raised in obedience as one of God's children. Before judgment comes upon the whole earth, it first came upon Christ. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. And probably the most well known scripture of in the entire world, John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But then in verse 17, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So this seems like it might be incompatible with what we read last week, maybe a little inconsistent, perhaps even contradictory. However, it's not. When Jesus says, I came to bring fire upon the earth, and then John 3, 17 says that he did not bring condemnation. Even though he did not bring condemnation, he came to bring salvation. Even though we deserve condemnation, but because God is rich in mercy with the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sin, he made us alive together with Christ. Jesus bore our sins and received our condemnation, our punishment, so that we might receive grace. He received our sin. We receive his righteousness. He received our judgment. We received his forgiveness. He received our wrath. We received his mercy. He received our death. And we received his life. This is the beautiful exchange. We exchange our filthy rags in exchange for his glory. And when this happens, we become the light of the world. In John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, John says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what's true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus is the light of the world, but when he is in us and we are in him, we become the light of the world. When this happens, it's not peace that Christ came to bring, but division. He came to bring the sword because Christ always divides. Truth is always in division against error. Truth is not relative the way the world believes, meaning 
You cannot define truth however you want to. Truth is not whatever you want it to be. Truth is truth whether you like it or whether you agree with it. The only people who know the truth are those who know God and his word. Jesus, during his arrest, right before he's to be crucified, he tells Pontius Pilate, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. That word to bear witness, it means to give testimony in a legal court. He came to give something under oath, and the truth is those who listen to his voice. Only those who listen to his voice can hear the truth. And the truth is that the wages of sin is death. That's the truth, and that's the bad news. However, Christ didn't come to bring the bad news. We already had the bad news. He came to bring the good news. And the good news is, is that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. <coughs> you can be saved from death and raised to life everlasting when you turn from your sin and give your life to Christ. And it's not that complicated. Too many people overly complicate the Bible. It's not complicated. The word of truth is in our hands. The word of life is in our hands. And it's easy to see and it's easy to read. But the world refuses to see it. In Luke chapter 12, verses 54 to 59. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, A shower is coming. And so it happens. When you see the south wind blowing, you say there's going to be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not know how to interpret this present time? Why do you not judge for yourself what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge. And the judge hands you over to the officer, and the officer puts you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. Back in 54 through 56, or in particular really 54 and 55, when you see the cloud rising in the west, you say the shower is coming. When you see the south wind blowing, you say it's going to be hot. So Jesus here is criticizing them for not recognizing what God is doing right in front of them. They saw what was going on, but they did not see what was taking place right before their eyes. If you have eyes to see, then see. Jesus implores them several times throughout the gospels this very thing. If you have ears to hear, then hear. And they had eyes to see, but they were not seen. They were not perceiving. The people did not discern the significance of Jesus' appearance before them. They could look up into the sky and see dark clouds and determine for themselves that rain's coming. And when the south wind was blowing, they knew that it was going to be a hot day. They could see that, but they could not see what was right in front of them. Hypocrites, Jesus called them. Pretenders. Even in the English language, the word hypocrite, somebody who does says one thing and does the other, that's essentially what it means. But originally, it's a Greek word. It, it was the word for an actor, a pretender, a mask wearer. It was for those who gave performances on a stage. They would wear a mask and pretend to be someone else. So when Jesus is calling them hypocrites, that's what he's saying to them. He says, you are actors. All of you are just pretenders. They pretended to be people of God. They pretended to know God and to study his word. They pretended to be the keepers and the teachers of it. They were of God, they proclaimed. But God was standing right in front of them, and they did not see him. Over in John chapter 1, in John's prologue, 
in verses 9 through 11. John's entire prologue there, the first 18 verses of John chapter 1, John tells you everything that's going to happen the rest of his gospel. He gives you the entire preface. He gives us his thesis statement. He tells us who Jesus is and then sets out to prove it the rest of the gospel. In John 1 verses 9 through 11, speaking about Jesus, he says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. How many times have you just read that verse and just contemplated it, thought about it, meditated on that verse? John, is his entire prologue, especially in the first several verses, he's taken us back to Genesis because he uses the exact same language. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John is saying that this Jesus is the God who was in the beginning. He is the one who made the world, the entire world, and everything in it was made through him. And the God who created the world came into the world, and nobody knew who he was. And it's no different today. If he showed up today and walked down the street, nobody would know who he was, because they're blind to see. He came to his own. It's speaking about the nation of Israel. God separated the nation of Israel to be his peculiar people, to be his kingdom of priests that were go, to go declare his glory to the nations. The whole Old Testament is written about him and for him. It all points to him. The very people who should have known exactly who he was, it says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. There are many Christian hypocrites today. They pretend to know God and be of God, but they have absolutely no idea or understanding what that even means. All the things they proclaim that they do in his name, when in fact it's the exact opposite of what God has commanded. Jesus is saying to this crowd, none of you are meteorologists. But you can tell me the weather. Yet on the other hand, you are all religious and you're all theologians, and yet you cannot understand the basic principles of the faith. Hypocrites. A modern day application is to say to those who are listening, to those who sit into the seats, that you can name everybody on your sports team and you don't know anything about the basic principles of the Christian faith, but yet proclaim yourself a Christian. You can tell everybody's name on offense and defense. You can give me their stats. When it comes to music, you know the lyrics to 50 songs, and yet you cannot recite one verse by heart. That's what he's telling these people, and it probably applies to a lot of people in this room, including yours truly who's speaking. I probably have more useless information in my brain than I do scripture memorized. By brain. I can sit there and sing 50 songs by heart, but I guarantee you I probably don't know 50 verses of scripture by heart. Hypocrites. Up until now in Luke's gospel, as we close out chapter 12, we've now made it halfway. So up until this point, everyone has seen or heard what Jesus has done in Judea and Galilee. Everything that Jesus does, it spreads like wildfire. You have to be living under a rock not to hear the things that Jesus has done. Everyone has either been an eyewitness to the things he's done or they've heard the things that he's done. He's healed numerous demoniacs, demon-possessed people that he has cast out demons on. He healed Peter's mother-in-law and immediately she was healed and began to Sir, everyone else in Capernaum heard about it. All those with various diseases came to him, and he healed all of them, the entire city of Capernaum. He cleansed the leper, and that day leprosy was incurable. Yet Jesus cured a man with an incurable disease. He made a paralytic man, a man who was paralyzed. Jesus told him to get up and walk home. The man stood up and walked home. 
He healed a man with a withered hand. He healed a centurion servant who wasn't even present when Jesus healed him. He was at home. He wasn't even in the same location. Jesus just gave the word and the man was healed. He raised a widow's son from the dead. He calmed the raging sea with just a word. He healed a woman who had a blood issue for 12 years and then turned around and raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He fed over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. He was transfigured on the mountain into glory and spoke with Moses and Elijah, and yet people still did not see it. How spiritually blind do people have to be to not see all that that was happening in front of them? They were eyewitnesses to these things. These were supposedly God's people. And Jesus told them who he was from the beginning of his ministry back in chapter 4. This wasn't a secret. He proclaimed who he was before he even started his ministry. Chapter 4, and 18 through 21, as he goes to Nazareth into the synagogue, he takes the scroll of Isaiah and then begins to read from it in verse 18. So this is Isaiah 61 that Jesus is reading from. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So that is the literal definition of the Hebrew word Messiah and the Greek word Christ. They mean the same thing. It means anointed one. More specifically, it means the anointed one by God. So Jesus is reading. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. And then we see down in verse 21, he tells everybody, today in your scripture, or today in your hearing, your scripture has been fulfilled. He's not beating around the bush. It's not a secret. Because the only way that this scripture can be fulfilled is in the Messiah. Jesus is telling them who he is. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now he's telling us what he is going to do as the Messiah, to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant, set down all the eyes of the synagogue fixed. That word fixed, it means they were transfixed on him they were staring at him and he told them that today in your scripture has been fulfilled fast forward over to chapter 7 beginning in verse 18 John the Baptist has been arrested he's now in prison some time has went by since Jesus has come on the scene he has done many things but yet everybody had a complete misunderstanding of who the Messiah was going to be. They thought he was going to ride in on a white horse. He was going to raise up an army. He was going to drive out the oppressors and reestablish the Davidic kingdom. But that's not what he came to do. He told us what he came to do when he quoted Isaiah 61. So in John, or excuse me, Luke 7, beginning in verse 18, the disciples of John, speaking to John the Baptist, they recorded all these things, everything that they've seen and heard. So John calls two of his disciples. He sends them to the Lord to ask him this question. Are you the one? Are you the Messiah who is to come or shall we look for another? So these men come to Jesus and they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And you remember when we covered these verses, they asked the question, there in verse 20, it's not answered till verse 22 because before Luke allows Jesus to answer, he gives, he inserts his own commentary. So all our eyes are open to see what's going on. They ask the question, are you the Messiah? So before Jesus answers, Luke says, okay, pay attention. While they're standing there asking this question, this is what's happening right in front of them. He healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. Many people who were blind, he bestowed sight. So Luke gives us a heads up of who he is, and then Jesus again answers it for himself. He doesn't come out and say it again. He's pointed them back to Isaiah chapter 61. 
Go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive the sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. So Jesus is just repeating, he's reiterating in his own words again, Isaiah 61, the messianic scripture of the Messiah. If anyone was paying attention, then they could see what was happening. Why do you not know how to interpret the present time? If they were open to the truth, then they would have seen what was going on. They would have recognized that the kingdom of God was upon them. But this message was rejected because it demanded repentance. And for the Pharisees and the experts of the law, a message of repentance is a message that was received with hostility because you're telling them that they're wrong that they're incorrect. You're exposing them as hypocrites because darkness hates the light. When light is shined on the darkness, it hates it because it's exposed. Hypocrites, Jesus says. Their problem wasn't because they were unable to discern the times. It wasn't inability. It was because they were unwilling. And we have the same problem with people today. It's not that people cannot see or they are unable to see what God's word says. It's right here in front of us. We have it in our laps. Everyone has access to it. The pages are in plain black and white. It's easy to read. It's easily discernible. It's not the inability to read and see what God's word says. It's the unwillingness to accept what it says. Because it says that you are a sinner and you are in need of a savior, that you must repent of your sins and be reconciled to the Father, and there is only one way to do it. And people don't like one way to do it. We want everything on our, our own terms. We are our own gods, and if we decide we need to be reconciled to some other god, then we want to do it under our own terms. We want to write the rules. We want the fine print. We want to be able to do what we want to do and still be reconciled. There is only one way to be reconciled to the Father. There's not 10 ways or 20 ways or 30 ways. All roads do not lead to Rome. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, only one. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, it means not one person, not anyone comes to the Father except through me. One, there is only one way for salvation. And everyone is able to see what it says. The problem is, is that everyone does not want to believe what it says because they are unwilling. They are unwilling to admit that they are wrong. They are unwilling to admit that there's something wrong with them. The gospel isn't rejected because of lack of understanding. It's rejected because it calls people to repent, to turn from their sin and give their lives to God. And that message has not changed. It's the same message that John the Baptist preached. It's the same message that Jesus preached. Peter, Paul, all the apostles and disciples, they all preach that same message. The message has not changed. God has not changed. His word has not changed. His commandments have not changed. His gospel to repent and believe has not changed. Why do you not know how to interpret this present time? It was that present time in salvation history when God was literally and physically standing right in front of them and they could not see him. They were blinded by their own self-righteousness and they failed to see the one true righteous one when he came. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. 
the very people who should have recognized him when he came did not recognize him. The only thing that they saw in Jesus was an opponent that needed to be removed. Down in 57 through 59. Why do not judge for yourself what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you've paid every last penny. Why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? A simple but complex question. Why do you not judge for yourselves what's right? That's a question that we'd probably like to ask a lot of politicians today. Why do you not judge what's right instead of what's convenient or what's politically beneficial? And many people were unwilling to judge Jesus on what was right. And it's no different today. We'll remember back in chapter 7, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the good news preached to them. If anyone judges Jesus on what is right, then there is only one conclusion that they can come to, that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one of God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And that good news is that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When one rightly reads the scriptures, there is only one right judgment to make about Jesus and that he is exactly who he says he is. He is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. He's the word that was made flesh he is the Son of God incarnate. And if you open your eyes and see, you will see him for who he truly is. And then you will be able to judge correctly. There in 58 and 59, Jesus uses this parable or a similitude once again to prove his point. So the Everything that we've covered the last three or four weeks, Jesus has, if you kind of follow along and pay attention, he said the exact same thing over and over. We're talking about who he is, and if you don't recognize him or you're not ready for who he is, then judgment's going to come quickly upon you. It's been the same message for about three or four weeks in a row. He's just said it differently. So on 58 and 59, again, he's talking about judgment. Two people are on their way to see a judge. This is an illustration again, once again, of the end time judgment. God is obviously the judge. And the two opponents represent Christ on one side. And then his adversaries who stand in opposition against him on the other side. And this goes back to verses 54 to 56 when speaking about his identity. Essentially, in 54 to 56, he's asking the crowd, how do you not know who I am? When you've seen everything that I've done since I've been here. And then in 57 to 59, he's saying, you better hurry up and come to a conclusion of who I am real quick. Because we're on the way to see the judge at this very moment. R.C. Sproul, in his commentary, kind of gives this little paraphrase conversation uh, verses 58 and 59. He did a good enough job. There was no reason for me to reinvent the will, so I'll just tell you what he said. So this is just a paraphrased conversation of verses 58 and 59 of Jesus speaking. He says, look, I'm here and we're discussing my identity and your allegiance either with me or against me. So we need to settle this issue right now. We are opponents and we are headed for the court but my father is the judge, and if you don't settle with me outside of court, then this judge is going to throw the book at you. He's going to turn you over to the constable, and the constable is going to throw you into prison. So that's essentially what's being said there in verses 58 
in 59, to put it in our modern day vernacular. So generally, one would like to resolve a crisis of a court date ahead of time in a wise manner in order to avoid severe penalty. So Jesus here is given this basic application of reconciliation with God before the day of judgment. If you wait until then, he's saying, then you've waited too long. If you wait until the day we come into court, then you've waited too long because judgment is going to come against you. And you're going to be thrown into prison. As we've seen the last couple of weeks, everything that he's talking about here is eternal. We have eternal blessings for those who are ready, eternal punishment for those who are not. Again, representing the final judgment when he's speaking there of the prison. In verse 59, I tell you, you will never get out until you've paid every last penny. You should not read into that, that this somehow is teaching that eventually one can get out of this prison. That's not what Jesus is speaking. He's using an illustration here. As everything that we've seen in the last couple of weeks goes against that. Once the door is shut, it is shut. As we see with the parable in chapter 16 with the rich man and Lazarus, there's this great gulf between us. Those who are over there cannot come over here. Those who are over here cannot go over there. Because this prison, there is a debt to be paid. And if you are without Christ, a person can never pay this debt in full. He has paid the debt that we cannot pay. So if you're thrown into this prison, you're not going to get out till you paid every last penny. Well, you will never have that last penny because you cannot pay that debt yourself. Jesus is once again stressing the urgency to be reconciled to God before the time of judgment. It's dangerous for people to continue to delay in seeing and recognizing who Jesus is. They always want to put it off for another time, for another week, for another day. And as we've seen in the parable of the rich man a couple of weeks ago, that day came upon him when he least expected it. He thought he was going to live the rest of his life in luxury. But God called him that very moment. You should make the right judgment in recognizing the necessity of Christ or the right judgment will be made against you. And God's judgment is right and it is just. You will be thrown into a prison that you will never be able to get out of. A decision should be made while there's still time. That's exactly the same message for about the last three or four weeks. It seems like I'm repeating myself. It's because Jesus is repeating himself. And any time in scripture, if it continues to repeat itself, it's because there's a lesson that needs to be learned. Because if you didn't pay attention the first three times, Jesus said, I hope you pay attention this fourth time. Because each and every one of us is on the way to stand in front of judgment at this very moment. And we don't know when that day is going to come. For some, it might come in a moment. For some of us, it might come from years from now. Either way, every one of us, every single one of us is going to stand in judgment. The arrival of God's kingdom with the coming of Christ was the alert that the time is now. And many people there in Jesus' time did not see it. It's time to be reconciled to God now before it's too late. Again, I continue to quote this same scripture at the end of the service the last few weeks because this is Jesus' message. The time is fulfilled. It means the time is up. Literally, there is no more time. We don't know when that next breath is coming. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It means it's right here and it's right now. You must repent, Jesus says, and believe the gospel. You must repent of your sins and believe that he is the one who came to save you. He is your savior. There is no other way. There is only one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Your faith must be put in him. That way, when you come before the judge, 
the judge will not bring judgment against you because you are standing in the righteousness of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we praise and honor and glorify you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your continued exhortation through it that our eyes might be open. That judgment is coming. And not only it's coming, you brought it with you when you took flesh upon yourself. We know that it's your wish and desire that judgment happens right now to be done with sin, to be eliminated from this earth and from your kingdom for forever. We also thankful for the time that you've allowed each and one of us to be delivered from this judgment because of your grace before you brought judgment on. We know that there's many people that we know and love that we pray that they too will repent and believe before judgment comes, that they too are standing on the right side, that they're separated with the sheep and not the goats, that they are with the wheat and not the chaff. We pray over this city and this community that we might reach them with your gospel. We pray if there's one here this morning that has not received you as Lord and Savior, that today is that day that your word has penetrated their heart and mind and they're ready to repent and give their life to you. Father, we praise, honor, and glorify your name for the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As we've seen the last few weeks, Jesus has said the same thing almost four weeks in a row. Judgment is coming, and you better be ready. And there's only one way to escape judgment, and it's through him. There is no other way, regardless if the world continues tries to tell us that there's 30 different ways, or as long as you believe something, you're going to be fine. As long as you believe in God or you have some kind of religious affiliation, but as we see in Scripture, that tells us that's not the case. There is no 10 or 20 ways. There's one way, and that's through Christ, that we must repent of our sins, give our lives to him, if we are going to stand before God in his righteousness. If you have any questions about salvation, baptism, I'm sure I'd love to meet with you. At this time, we're going to stand and worship through song one more time, and don't forget, Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we're going to begin our study in Exodus.
Thank <laughs> you. 